Hello, welcome to SQL Server Administration on Linux Basics. As you all know, Microsoft SQL Server 2017 is now available across platform, so you do not need to restrict yourself to only Windows as the hosting platform for your database server. This is a course for all SQL Server enthusiasts who want to learn administration of SQL Server on Linux. This course details all the prerequisites for administration on Linux with hands-on for basic commands on Linux giving side-by-side -side examples for the same in a Windows for better understanding. This course will not only help you to learn SQL, but also give you the confidence to work as a DBA on a Linux environment. We have used CentOS as the platform for Linux and SQL Server 2017 general availability as the version for the database engine. We have tried to cover most of the client tools available for SQL Server, showcasing the administration possible for the same on Linux. Now coming to this introductory course, first uh, we will take you briefly through the introduction of SQL Server in history from SQL Server 1 to SQL 2017. We will cover next the newly introduced features in SQL 2017 which interest most of the DBS. Next we will look into the Active Directory and DNS basics, followed by the Active Directory installation and configuration and by the by installation and configuration of DNS touching all the important points which are required to understand from an enterprise infrastructure perspective. We will install a CentOS Linux using a GUI for better understanding from a novice point of view. We will see all the basic commands related to the Linux system and configuration of network and other essentials. Next, we will run into a SQL Server offline install on a Linux platform followed by the installation of tools and SQL agent. We will showcase the joining of domain of a Linux server and to create an Active Directory user followed by creating an Active Directory login in SQL and then connecting to the SQL server system from a Linux environment using Active Directory user. We will also cover the basics of administration of SQL server on Linux. Coming to the history of SQL server. In 1989, Microsoft and Sybase jointly released its first version of SQL Server 1. It was designed for the IBM OS by 2 platform with 16-bit architecture. At early 1900s, Microsoft and Sybase began to develop a new version of SQL Server for the NT platform. During it was under development, Microsoft decided that SQL Server should be tightly coupled with the NT operating system. In 1992, Microsoft assumed co-responsibility for the future of SQL Server for NT. In 1993, Windows NT 3.1 and SQL Server 4.2 for NT were released. Microsoft's viewpoint introduced a high-performance database with user-friendly interface proved to be very successful. Microsoft quickly became the second most popular vendor of a high-end relational database software. In 1993, Microsoft and Sybase formally parted their partnership. In 1995, Microsoft released its first version of SQL Server independent of Sybase. This release was a major rewrite of SQL Server's core technology. Version 6 significantly improved performance, provided built-in replication, and delivered centralized administration. In 1996, Microsoft released version 6.5 of SQL Server. This version brought significant enhancements to the existing technology and provided several new features. In 1997, Microsoft released version 6.5 edition. In 1998, Microsoft released version 7 of SQL Server, which was a complete rewrite of the database engine. In 2000, Microsoft released SQL Server 2000 and a version 2000 is Microsoft's most significant release of SQL Server to date. The version further builds upon SQL Server 7 framework. The SQL Server 2000 included more modification and extensions to the Sybase code base, adding support for IA64 architecture. Only SQL Server Relational Engine and SQL Agent were ported to the Itanium at the time. Client tools like Enterprise Manager would still be running on 32-bit x86 clients. SQL Server 2000 included SSAS, RS, and IS. SQL 2005 released in November 2005, introductory code name Yukon. SQL Server 2005 included newly XML data types CLR, T2, 
TDS, MARS, DMBs, snapshot isolation level, and SSMS client tool. Concept of SQL OS was also introduced. With the release of Service Pack 1 of SQL Server 2005, database mirroring was introduced as a high availability option that provided redundancy and failover capabilities at database level. Database mirroring was included in the first release of 2005 for evolution purposes only, which was later on released as a full-fledged service from Service Pack 1. SQL Server 2008 released in August 2008 and formal code name Katmai. It was introduced. It introduced some new features like spatial data types, file stream, TDE, database commandlet PowerShell, and incorporated PowerShell in SSMS and IntelliSense for query building. 2008R2 released in April 2010 and the formal code name Kilimanjaro. There were some major upgrades in the BI tool belt and backup compression was available in all versions of R2 except Express. Microsoft announced the next version of SQL Server codenamed Denali. It was released to manufacturing on March 2012. SQL Server 2012's new features and enhancements included SQL Server Always On Failover Clustering Instances, Availability Groups, which provided a set of options to improve database availability. Newly introduced contained databases, which simplified the moving of databases between instances. New and modified dynamic management views and functions. Performance in Enhancements such as columns to indexes, as well as improvements to security by provisioning new server roles. SQL 2014 was released to ma manufacturing in March 2014 with code name Hackathon. SQL 2014 provided a new in memory capability for tables that can fit entirely into memory. For disk based SQL Server application, it also provided SSD buffer pool extension which improved performance by cache between RAM and the spinning media. SQL Server 2014 also enhanced the always-on solution by increasing the readable secondaries count and sustaining read operations. It provided a new hybrid disaster recovery and backup solution with Azure, enabling customers to use existing skills with on-prem version of SQL Server to take advantage of Microsoft's global data center like Azure. SQL Server 2016 is the most recent version available. The official general availability release date of 2016 was June 2016. SQL Server 2016 uh, supported only on x86 processors. It did not support x86 processors. Enhance it, uh, in, there were some uh, enhancements in the memory OLTP. It supported up to 2 TB of uh, space from uh, 256 GB. It had support for column store index enhancements for storing always on availability groups. New security features included always encrypted when enabled only application that had encryption key and access the encrypted sensitive data in SQL Server 2016. The key was never passed to the SQL Server. Row level security. Data access can be restricted at the engine level so users only see what is relevant to them. The latest build of SQL Server is uh, SQL Server 2017 general availability. We will be discussing the new features for 2017 in detail in the next video. Hello, in the previous videos we have covered the history of SQL Server with respect to evolution from SQL 1 to 2017. In this video we will be covering uh, features newly introduced in uh, SQL Server 2017 general availability. SQL Server 2017 is a major transformation towards making SQL Server a cross-domain platform which not only provides an opportunity to work on various development languages but also gives a choice of operating systems by bringing power of SQL Server to Linux, Linux-based Docker containers and Windows. Resumable Online Index gives a functionality to pause an ongoing rebuild index operation and resume it and also takes care of the index rebuild operation 
in event of a failover to replica or disk out of space. The next feature is Rebuild Identity Cache. This enables or disables identity cache on a database level. The default is on. This significantly improves the insert performance on tables with identity columns. To avoid gaps of values of identity column in case of a SQL Server unexpected shutdown or a failover, we can disable the identity cache option. Sometimes the plan chosen by the optimizer may not be the best plan for a variety of reasons. Maybe the number of estimated rows passed was not correct. In this scenario, the amount of memory granted for the particular query may be too low or too high. The adaptive query processing monitors the repetitive workload and has a feedback for the batch mode memory grant. Hence, when a similar query runs again, it understands if more memory needs to be allocated, preventive, preventing an expensive spill to the disk and hence optimizing the query. Automatic database tuning. Now automatic database tuning is uh, again introduced in 2017 and uh, it, it basically notifies you whenever there is a potential performance issue detected and lets you apply the corrective actions or lets the database engine automatically fix the problems. Automatic tuning in SQL 2017 enables you to fix and identify and fix the performance issues caused by SQL plan choice regressions. Automatic tuning in SQL Azure databases creates necessary indexes and drops unused indexes. Scale out feature in SSIS. Integration service scale out provides a high performance package execution by distributing executions to multiple machines. It means you can submit a request for a multiple package executions in SQL Server Management Studio. These packages will be executed in parallel in a scale-out mode. SSIS scale-out consists of a scale-out master and one or more scale-out workers. The scale-out master is responsible for a scale-out management and receives the package execution request from the users. Scale-out workers pull execution tasks from the scale-out master and do the package execution work. The next is clusterless availability groups. The new availability group functionality includes clusterless support, minimum replica commit availability group settings, and Windows Linux cross OS migration and testing. SQL Server machine, le uh, machine learning is nothing but R services renamed to reflect the support for Python in addition to the R language. Now we can use machine learning in database to learn R or Python scripts in SQL Server or install Microsoft Machine Learning Server to deploy, consume R and Python models that don't require SQL Server. Welcome to the installation and configuration of Windows Active Directory and DNS. In the previous videos, we have discussed the new features introduced in SQL Server 2017 general availability. For this tutorial series, we will be using Oracle VirtualBox for the installation of virtual machines. First, we will begin with the installation of Windows Server 2016. Uh, we will run through the setup of Windows Server 2016 and we will choose GUI for the training purpose. But we can definitely install the core edition as well which will give us a better performance as there will be less GUI components to be loaded. But we need some advanced administration skills to manage and maintain the servers. Okay, so uh, what is an Active Directory? Active Directory is a Windows OS directory service that facilitates working with interconnected, complex, different network resources in a unified manner. Now, Active Directory was initially released with Windows Server 2000 and revised with additional features in Server 2008. Active Directory provides a common interface for organizing and maintaining information related to resources connected to a variety of network directories. The directories may be system based like uh, Windows OS, application specific or network resources like printers. Active Directory serves as a single data store for quick data access to all users and controls access for users based on directory's security policy. Active Directory has a couple of network resources, the lightweight directory access protocol LDAP, an open standard used to access other directory services. Security service using principles of SSL or secure socket layer and Kerberos based authentication. 
hierarchical and internal storage of organizational data in a centralized location for faster access and better network administration. Now what is DNS? The domain name service, the domain name system or DNS is a system for naming computers and network services that is organized into a hierarchy of domains. DNS is required for the support of active directory domain services. As an example, we can say that a client computer sends the name of a remote host to a DNS server which responds with its corresponding IP. The client computer can then send messages directly to the remote host's IP address. Now in case a DNS server does not have an entry in its database for the remote host, it can respond to the client with the address of a different DNS server that is more likely to have information about the remote host or it can query the other DNS itself. So let's begin with the installation of Windows Server 2016. We are using Oracle VirtualBox as mentioned before. So let's begin with the installation. The setup is typically a standard setup which we'll be using. We'll be using a data center edition with desktop experience. Okay, and uh, we are using an evaluation edition which will be expiring in 180 days. Okay, so first of all, we'll uh, choose, as you see, there are a lot of options. So we will be choosing uh, the last option that is Windows Server 2016 Data Center with desktop experience. Okay, we'll uh, accept the license. We'll click on custom. There's just one disk, so we'll click next and the setup will begin. Now we'll uh, zoom through this uh, setup. Uh, just to, for the benefit of timelines basically here the setup will be expanding the files which are required for a setup so a 4 GB setup will blow up your hard disk to essentially 10 to 15 GB of your hard disk space when you choose a desktop experience and uh, this will be followed uh, further by updates once the installation begins uh, the setup uh, or the installation should not take uh, 15 to 20 minutes normally and uh, will be followed by a system restart and the setup will continue. Now, uh, this is uh, the, the timelines mentioned will vary from system to system and will depend upon the amount of resources that you have put in in this uh, virtual machine while you are building it. As you can see, the installation is now finished. So this will be uh, followed by a system uh, restart as mentioned before. Uh, so this screen shows up and uh, uh, you can either wait for uh, the restart to happen automatically or you can click on restart now so we'll just wait and uh, so the system is restarting now okay so this is uh, what the system boot screen looks like once the setup is complete so this is the first time it will be uh, booting up and post this you will see administrator login password console where you have to key in the password for the administrator so we'll choose a password uh, according to the requirement of a policy okay and we'll re-enter the password and we'll click on finish so this uh, should uh, essentially complete the installation we'll hit on control alt del and uh, key in the password okay so this network is the first console that comes up we'll just click on the default yes okay and uh, now we'll uh, for, uh, fire up uh, powershell okay and we'll uh, pin this to the taskbar since uh, we'll be using it a uh, lot more frequently so just click on this pin to the taskbar okay okay and the first thing we'll uh, try to do is uh, configure a static ip for this node or computer now we'll fire up ncp.cpl which is a very handy shortcut uh, for network uh, opening up the network console we'll just click on this ethernet card properties and uh, we'll disable this ipv6 first we'll go to ipv4 and uh, click on the properties and put in uh, ip address so we'll key in 192.168.26.107 okay and uh, we'll give the first DNS as the router 192.168.26.1 and the second one will be itself. Okay, we'll close this. Uh, we'll uh, hit on the PowerShell and try to, okay, let's first disable and enable it. This will refresh the IPs and will reconfigure with the new IPs. 
okay now let's hit uh, google okay yeah so this should come up after some time essentially the nick card will take some time to configure okay uh, so now we'll move on to add roles and features click next uh, to move to the installation type here we are going to go for role based installation so we'll choose next here we'll choose the node name as you can see the node name is not correct it, it's the one that came up with the binary so we'll cancel this we'll go to the open uh, explorer click on right click on the pc go to properties and click on advanced features go to the general computer name and uh, click on change here we'll change the computer name as uh, win ad okay and we'll hit okay uh, this will essentially ask us to restart the computer before the effect can change okay yes and we'll restart now it will say uh, take some time for the services to stop and then the computer will start again okay so yeah click it and it will uh, enter the password the server manager will open up by default it will take some time as it is a virtual machine we have now set up the IP address and changed the computer name and now we'll add the role of Active Directory and by the by the DNS as well. So we'll click on uh, add uh, roles and features. Okay, click on next. Okay, we'll need to choose uh, Active Directory domain services. Uh, we'll click next and uh, yeah we'll click on add features here we will not choose our dns as uh, it will come in the configuration of active directory so we'll click on next okay and uh, we'll click on next apds next and we'll click on the install now it will uh, take some time for the installation to complete uh, depending upon the amount of memory and CPU that we have chosen for this DM node. I recommend uh, to take a high memory uh, uh, node when or giving it a higher memory while installation is uh, running through and once the installation is complete you can trim down the resources. Okay, uh, so post this uh, installation is complete you will see a warning sign um, on top and uh, this will ask us to promote uh, this computer to a Active Directory domain controller. Okay, so this is a uh, first uh, DNS in this. So we'll choose forest and we'll give the name as uh, SQL frenzy dot local as the domain name and click on next. There will be some configurations related to the forest and domain function level. This is just a way of letting this uh, DC know what are the other configuration of DNS available for this farm. Okay, uh, you can choose uh, basically uh, backward compatibility till 2008, but uh, we'll just leave the default. Now DSRM is the safe mode for Windows DC, so this password must be kept uh, really safe. So we won't be choosing a delegation of DNS and we'll move on to the next screen. Now we'll choose the NetBIOS name, uh, SQL Frenzy and uh, we'll click on next. We'll get the default paths for this and uh, we'll accept it and uh, we'll click on next. Just check through the options that we have chosen. We'll click on next and uh, a couple of warnings show up but uh, we'll go with the install okay so now the installation will begin now this will start uh, promoting the server as a dc it will take some time before the setup completes as uh, we should be seeing a pop-up stating the system will be restarted and uh, ad was installed or removed it will restart the system the system will be booting up as a dc now and uh, the services will be starting for active directory Okay, so now once the computer restarts, uh, we will see the first Active Directory account, which was uh, SQL Frenzy uh, Administrator. So the domain which we chose was SQL Frenzy. So we'll be seeing the first uh, domain login now for the Administrator account, which will be moving uh, to the AD. The first AD account will be created by default. Okay, here you see the SQL Frenzy Administrator will clean the password. 
okay again the server manager your best buddy for windows server will start up and by the by we'll fire up a powershell yeah so now we'll uh, click on or execute the dsa.msc which is a good shortcut for uh, active directory console now you see uh, the active directory console has come up so you will not find anything in the computers because we have not added uh, but if you go to the domain controllers you will find the first object here win ad which we just created here we can see all the information related to this and uh, we'll see the member of and we'll see delegation now delegation is an important feature which we will be covering while installation of uh, sql and then authentication through ad okay all the things look uh, pretty much standard and normal so we'll close this and uh, we will go back and uh, create a users so we'll create a user uh, which we'll be using later on for uh, our communication through active directory so we'll name it as uh, sql on tux okay uh, we'll name it as sql on tux and the login uh, user login essentially will again we'll choose the same name which will be sql on tux okay we'll hit on next we'll give it a password okay and uh, we'll uncheck this feature of uh, password prompting and we'll click on password never expires click on next and finish so we'll see a user sql on tux which is we have created okay uh, so it's time now for us to look into the dns management part uh, so let's fire up the command dns management.msc which is the quick shortcut for dns management console okay so this is how primary face here dns management console looks like well we will have a hell of a lot of zones so we'll begin with the forward lookup zone first so you see sqlpenzi.local and uh, there is no reverse lookup zone so we'll create a reverse lookup zone We'll click on next and we'll leave primary zone yes we'll choose the defaults and we'll look in the ipv4 we'll key in the ipv4 address that is 192.168.26 which is the pointer record main function okay and we'll choose the allow dynamic updates click on next click on finish and we have a forward lookup zone and a reverse lookup zone now set up so we'll give in the first entry we'll add a a pointer record to, for our dns server we'll choose 107 and we'll browse this we'll go to the forward lookup zone and we have to click on the forward lookup zone once again and we'll choose the lookup zone folder we'll scroll down and choose win ad which is our main record okay click on okay and you will see the a pointer record is created Hello, uh, we will be looking into the installation of Linux in this video. We will be choosing CentOS as the platform. We will be uh, looking into CentOS 7 with graphic user interface. You can use the CentOS without GUI also, but uh, you will need advanced administration skills to manage these servers. In our advanced series, we will be using the non-GUI based servers as well to showcase those skills. We will run through the setup step by step and we will try to explain why our feature has been chosen. So while we are running the setup of Linux, as of now, let's look into a little history about Linux. It was created by Linus Torvalds, a Finnish American software developer. The Linux kernel is much in use by Linux based operating system, Chrome OS and much more popular Android. There are a lot of flavors of Linux available these days. The enterprise version of Linux is known as RHEL. luckily which is also available for general public uh, by using a developer edition now centos is freely available and is essentially rhel in the core other than the licensing part we will be using language as english united states as presently there is a restriction of this language on the installation of linux in 2017 we'll click on next so first of all we will choose the region and date time We will make sure that the language support is English US. We will choose the software to have a server with a GUI. 
and so with GUI and uh, yeah and click on done then we will choose the installation destination click on done okay uh, so this will take some time to reflect so we'll have to wait okay okay next we will choose the host and network settings here we'll try to configure the NIC card so we'll click on configure we'll switch it on and then click on configure so there will be a lot of settings present uh, we'll start with general settings we will need to click this to automatic this will help the network connection to establish when the switch on uh, when we switch on the node we'll next move to ipv4 we'll uh, change it to manual and we'll add an ip address 192.168.26.172 we'll give the default uh, net mask and gateway will be 192.168.26.1 and uh, we'll also add a dns server 192.168.26.103 okay and then we'll uh, need to save this uh, next uh, we will move to ipv6 settings and we will ignore this setting so that it does not conflict okay and then uh, we'll save this and we'll click we'll check everything looks fine We'll click on done okay and we'll click on next for the installation to begin okay here we'll uh, set the password for root we'll uh, give a password for root and if you don't choose a strong password it will show weak so we will have to click on done twice to make sure that these settings are accepted okay and next uh, we'll create a user uh, the user will be sql admin Okay, and then we'll uh, choose a password for this user and again if you do not use a, a standard password it will again show weak in the strength part and then you have to click on done twice to make this happen okay now uh, this will take some time to finish so we'll fast forward this uh, typically it should take around uh, 15 to 20 minutes depending upon the resources that you have allocated for this uh, VM so now it's asking for a reboot so we have rebooted the system so now the system will uh, boot up with a graphic user interface uh, which we had chosen while installation it will take some time for the first time to load uh, while this setting is getting loaded i would like to mention that options we have chosen is very basic for better understanding and an in our advanced series, we will be creating separate mount point partitions which will be helpful in installation of database as per the industry standards. Okay, so now uh, this has come up. We'll accept the license information. Just click on I accept the license settings and click on done. Okay, and now click on next. Okay, so final, link, so the final settings are being uh, established. Now the system will boot with the GUI. Okay, we'll try to log in uh, as a root user. So we'll give the username as root. Click on next, give the password, and click on sign in. Okay, uh, so now it would take some time uh, for the screen to boot up for the first time since it is loading the profiles and everything. So uh, as discussed before, like uh, we will be creating another advanced series where we'll be covering mount points based out of SAN in Linux servers to replicate the industry standards. So now we see the server has boot up. Okay, so we'll try to open up a terminal. And uh, yeah, now we'll try to ping something. So we'll ping Google and check if the internet connectivity is there. Yep, it's working fine. So the configurations uh, have worked out as expected. I will click this next. Choose this as US states. And, uh, go to next. Yep, and uh, we are all set uh, to start working on CentOS. Okay, 
and the next video which will be following we will try to cover up some commands based on Linux in analogy with Windows commands. Thank you. Hello and uh, welcome to this module uh, which is basic administration on Linux. In this module uh, we will be covering our uh, file handling, uh, user handling, yum which is yellow dog updater modified and uh, system related information for Linux which will be useful for Linux administration. Okay uh, so let's begin with file handling. Uh, we will be showing two different windows here uh, one for uh, Windows operating system and other for uh, Linux operating system we will open up putty so first of all uh, we'll go ahead and open a putty connection to one of the linux boxes that we have we'll uh, log in as sql frenzy domain user okay domain local we'll key in the password and we are logged into the system. So we will check the path pwd as the keyword to check which path path presently we are in. So we will try to uh, put these windows uh, side by side in a stacked format. Okay. So now first of all we will create a new folder uh, called the scripts. Okay. So we have uh, made an intentional mistake and uh, will rename it as the correct name scripts okay now we will see the same thing on a Linux environment we will create a directory mkdir scripts but with a faulty name okay and we will click on enter so uh, if you do a ls or a ll you will see what are the files inside it so it shows the correct name now to rename in Linux you can use the command mv so we'll give the faulty name and the correct name that is scripts okay and we'll click enter now if you see the files you will see the correct name so this is how we modify or rename in Linux and in Windows okay now let's uh, create a file okay uh, let's first create a scripts underscore one dot txt file okay and let's do the same in linux we'll move inside the folder and we'll create a file with the command touch so scripts underscore one uh, dot txt okay if we do uh, pwd and then if you do uh, ls you will see the file is already created okay now the shortcut for clearing screen is control l which we just did and if you see there are one file scripts now if you want to see the details of this file you can press ll or ls minus ltr okay so here it shows the file details now uh, if you want to edit this file in windows you just go ahead and double click and update something like this is a normal uh, script file okay and uh, uh, put some hash just to make sure this is a comment okay and then we try to save this file it's normal file and save now we'll try to do the same thing in Linux. VI editor is the keyword. Now to press insert, you have to press I. It will go to the insert mode. You can start typing. This is a normal script file. Okay. And then to save, you'll have to press escape and then colon WQ. Okay. Now if you do a cat, you will be able to see what is the content of the file okay now to read uh, or to uh, auto complete any uh, any instruction you can press tab in Linux so uh, whenever you want to complete uh, the full path you can just press tab once okay now let's go ahead and add something like a comment uh, probably an echo uh, hello world 
properly. And uh, let's put some exclamation marks. Okay, and we'll save this file. Now, if you want to edit again, you have to use VI. Just press tab, this will auto complete. Press insert. Go to the last part of the line, press enter, and put a comment again. Echo. Put in quotes. Hello world. Okay, press escape, press colon WQ, you will save the file, you can put cat, and this is how the file looks like. Okay. Okay, uh, so next we'll see how to search a file in Windows. Uh, so probably we'll uh, open this uh, scripts.txt. Okay, and we'll press Control F and try to find is. Okay, we'll press enter a couple of times. It will say you cannot find any more. So the file just has two is. Now let's try to search the same thing in Linux. We'll open the file. Okay, press backslash and type S and press enter. Okay, now since there are only two is, you will find that is the two times it shows up. Okay, uh, so now let's uh, rename this file to uh, probably a PowerShell file. We'll put it as script underscore one dot uh, ps1. Okay, so that's uh, normal how we do in Windows. Now let's try to see how we do that in Linux. So we'll use the same mv command. So we'll put mv script.txt and we'll put it as dot ps1. So click enter and then if you do a ls, you will find the new name of the file. Welcome to the basic administration of Linux. In the previous videos, uh, we have seen file handling and in this video, we will be covering user handling in Linux. Okay, uh, so let's begin with uh, user handling in Linux. So first of all, we'll open uh, lusr.mgr.msc, uh, which is the shortcut for uh, user management in Windows. So first of all, we'll go to users and create a new user. We'll create a user called uh, new local. Okay, we'll uh, give the full name as new local. Okay, and sorry, new local, and uh, give the description as uh, this is a new local user. Okay, and uh, we'll give the password and uh, confirm the password. We'll uncheck the change request and make it a password never expire. Oops, the password uh, should be same. My bad. Okay, let's gain the password once again. Okay, and if you just cancel this, uh, you will see the new local user created. Okay, so now uh, let's go to the groups and create a new group. Okay, so let's give the group name uh, SQL groups. Okay, and description maybe this is a SQL group. Okay, we'll click on advanced, we'll click on find, we'll click on new local, hit OK, press OK and confirm. So now we see a new group has been created, SQL group and uh, we have created a SQL group and its default member is a new local. Okay, so now let's try to do the same on our Linux platform. So we'll open up a connection as a root. Uh, we will create a user. So we can create user using uh, user add. And we'll give the new name as uh, Linux local. Okay, now we'll set the password for it using the keyword password Linux local. Okay, 
so this will ask for the password new password so we'll key a new password and hit enter now you may get a warning if you choose a dictionary word uh, and if you do the password again okay so the password has been updated successfully now let's try to uh, open up a new session okay uh, so okay let's try to create a new session from here itself so we'll open a new session and uh, connect to the box 192.168.26.171 okay we'll log in as linux local and we'll key in the password and we will see a successful login okay so the login id has been created and we are successfully able to log in okay we can do a who am i this will show as linux local okay so now uh, let's try to see the groups now if you see uh, you will see a linux local group created so whenever you create a user in linux a default group is created now let's try to add it to a different group uh, okay uh, let's create a new group uh, uh, so we will use group add SQL groups okay uh, now we have created a new group SQL group so if you just uh, see the ATC groups with keyword SQL you will see SQL groups is coming up and it does not have any member as of now now let's add a member that is a Linux local to this so we will use user mod minus a is for add and minus g is for group so we will key in sql group and the linux local which is the user to be added to this group so now you just hit enter and now if you see the groups again uh, the linux local is added to this group okay uh, so now uh, let's try to reset the password for this new local that we have created in windows so we'll click on this and key in a new password and confirm the new password okay hit enter okay oops the password did not match my bad let's try once again with the new password and confirm password okay it has taken now let's do the same thing in the next so we will again use the keyword password here to uh, reset the password so we'll key in password and linux local oops uh, linux local okay so now we'll key in a new password and again if you choose a dictionary word uh, you will get a warning that's fine just retype the password and now uh, you have updated the password successfully so this is how we update password in linux Okay, uh, so now let's see how to promote a normal user to a administrator user. So in Windows, uh, we will go to groups, uh, we'll go to the administrators group and we'll add a new member here. Uh, we'll go to advanced and we'll click on find now and then search the user which we want to promote as a administrator user. So we will click on new local and click OK and press on apply and click ok so now this is how uh, we promote a normal user to administrator in windows now let's try to see the same thing in linux so in linux we have a sudoverse file which will help you to give a sudo privilege to a user so we will uh, open this file etc sudoverse okay and uh, we'll go to the last line of this file okay okay now if you want to uh, copy and paste a file in uh, vi what you can do you can go to the starting of the line press yy and then press p so this is how a new line is inserted so we will just uh, edit the first part of the line and we will key in the linux local uh, user which we want to promote as a sudoer uh, just press escape and it will give you error for a read only file you have to give colon wq exclamation okay so now if you see uh, login as uh, linux local and now if you want to view the sudoers file uh, you can just give sudo cat etc sudoers 
and it will ask you for the password with a very good warning so this is how you can promote a user to a root user in Linux okay uh, welcome back to basic administration on Linux in this session uh, we will be covering yum and rpm which will be required for installation and uninstallation of packages okay uh, so let's fire up a putty and uh, we'll see what is yum all about so let's just type the command yum and see what are the options we are getting so you will get a plethora of options and uh, you can read through this option so yum and a better way to understand this will be uh, through manual so we'll open up man yum so as the first name shows yum stands for yellow dog updater modified and it's a package or a product or a utility which will be used for installation and uninstallation of softwares on Linux platform okay so uh, let's try to see uh, installation of a software so first of all we can check uh, using rpm minus q to check whether a package is installed or not so here we checked uh, if msql tools are installed or not so we found that it is installed so now let's remove the software first okay click on yes completed so now let's go to the path where we have the binaries for this utility so we'll go to cd temp where we have kept the binary okay uh, so in the meanwhile let me also tell you if you want to clear your screen you can just type clear or uh, there's a shortcut you can just type control and press L now this will clear your screen automatically okay so now let's see uh, what are the files uh, we need to install uh, as part of this binary installation so this is the MSSQL tool files we will need to install we will use RAM install and then the binary name so this will ask uh, for a prompt we will give yes and we'll accept the license with capital yes okay and this is how the installation is complete we'll go to cd opt mssql tools where uh, we will check the binary folder and we'll type sql cmd so sql cmd is installed that means the client installation was successful okay uh, welcome back to administration on Linux so in this video we will be covering system information where we will be showing how to check the system related information on a Windows and parallelly on a Linux environment okay so first of all uh, we'll open up a PowerShell and a putty we will first do NS lookup to a Linux node LSD NDE01 dot uh, SQL frenzy dot local okay so now against the name we got the IP that is requested and now we'll do a NS lookup to a windows node wsdnde 11sqlfrenzylocal okay so this is the IP that we expected now uh, let's do a trace route this trace route will uh, identify the path or the route it is taking to reach to the final destination okay so this is just one hop okay and now the same thing in Linux trace route WSD NDE 11 dot SQL frenzy dot local okay so it will be just one hop and then it will uh, finish so it took just 0.379 ms now let's look into the capacity management so first of all we'll check uh, how to check the capacity on windows so we'll fire a powershell okay and now we'll see the similar command in linux that is df minus h okay so this is how we compare and see capacity okay uh, now let's see what are the tasks list uh, we have or what are the things that are running on the host which are consuming cpu and memory which essentially we see in a task manager in windows but here we have seen it through a partial and now we will see the same thing in linux using top so top gives you a very interactive view of what are the processes running and uh, there are a couple of options uh, through which you can sort uh, the list uh, so first we will see uh, top minus o and then you give pid 
so this will sort the top output using a process ID now if you want to sort by CPU it's a little tricky so you have to give percentage CPU so this will sort uh, by CPU so this is how you can work with top on a Linux environment Uh, welcome to SQL Server Administration Basics. Uh, in this module, we'll be covering SQL Server installation. Uh, below is the link for the release page. I uh, will be going in detail in the release page to understand uh, what are the RPMs that we need to choose for installation of SQL Server and Agent. So we'll be covering SQL Server and uh, configuring SQL Server, and uh, in the end, we will be installing SQL CMD command line utility and then connecting and checking the basic uh, commands on SQL. So let's begin. Okay, so uh, first of all, let's uh, look into the release notes for SQL 17 2017 on Linux. So uh, in this release notes, uh, we'll try and understand. So we are looking into the general availability, which is in October 2017. And here you will see uh, the installation guides for all types on versions of uh, Linux. So we will look into the RHEL. Uh, first, so we'll see the installation guides, the prerequisites that are mentioned, 3.25 GB memory, and uh, how to install the command line tools through a repo file and then connect locally and then query your data. So here we will not be using uh, the normal repo which is based on internet. Uh, we will be choosing the RPMs directly and for this we'll scroll down and identify the RHEL related RPM so we'll click on this link and if you open this uh, link uh, you will come to this page and uh, we'll choose RHEL and uh, we'll go to version 7 here in uh, the prod folder you will find all the dependencies and command line utilities that is required for SQL Server 2017 We'll move to SQL Server 2017 folder. Here you will find all the important files related to SQL Server itself, like SQL Server agent, full text index, uh, then there is always on, which is HA, and then integration services. So these are the packages which are available uh, in this uh, folder of SQL Server 2017, as mentioned. And inside, uh, if you go to prod, then you will find all the binaries related to the components of SQL Server, which is required. The link for the same is again uh, given in the deck and uh, we'll now be moving to the installation of SQL. Okay, uh, so welcome to the installation of uh, SQL Server. So as you can see, uh, we have uh, installed one basic CentOS. So this is the operating system you get if you choose a server with basic uh, command line uh, utility. Initially, we have shown you the installation of a graphic user interface for CentOS, which is having a very good UI. But in this, uh, you will not be having a, a very crisp UI. You will be having very basic uh, things. So from here, we'll just identify the IP address and then we'll open a terminus, uh, which is a command line utility in uh, Macintosh. We'll connect to the server, which is uh, on the same lines of putty. And we can start working from here. Uh, so first of all, uh, we'll create the folders required. So we'll uh, create a MSSQL folder inside temp by using the command make directory. And uh, inside this uh, MSSQL will uh, download all the packages that are required. So first of all, we'll uh, use the utility wget. So wget, uh, we will use a couple of parameters along with it, which is minus m and uh, minus nd. Now minus m uh, is required for connecting to redundant mirrors, which are available for uh, from the particular site we are downloading. And uh, minus nd will be used for downloading them to the present directory without creating the directories which are present in the parent FTP server. Okay, so these are the basic things. Uh, now, as you see, we are now again moved back to home. So we will try to uh, further uh, move to the MSSQL uh, directory which we have created. So we'll just press Control C, and uh, we will move back. Uh, to the directory which is uh, temp ms sql server okay uh, so now uh, we'll see there are no files and the present directory is temp ms sql so we'll just uh, use 
uh, the wget command which we have prepared and uh, this will download the latest version of SQL Server or uh, let me correct myself the present uh, latest version of SQL Server which we are uh, using as of now I'm sure uh, we will have a couple of releases uh, because uh, they have promised to give us a release with a bug fix of the recent identifications uh, very soon okay so uh, here uh, we will be downloading and uh, we are using the wget utility so we are downloading it uh, directly from the link which we have given in the previous uh, slides or it's also present in the deck okay uh, so this will typically take some time uh, so we'll pause the installation and uh, we'll, we'll resume once the download is complete okay so the install so the downloads is almost uh, complete now so we'll check all the binaries that have been downloaded the rpm file is downloaded for sql server so now let's uh, go ahead and install so we will use the yellow dog updater modified utility for this we'll do a yum install and give the binary name it will check all the dependency and we'll say yes okay so the installation will begin uh, it will uncompress all the files that are present in the rpm and then place it in the installation directory folder suppose this uh, installation of sql server there will be another uh, setup we have to run so that will be required for configuring all the basic parameters like the default uh, folder name or the default uh, backup folder for uh, user databases so all these uh, properties will be set up using that command we will also set up the uh, administrator login uh, password with that uh, default command okay so the installation is uh, almost complete it seems okay yeah so now we need to run this command which i mentioned before so just copy and uh, press this ms conf setup okay so here we'll be using the developer edition okay and uh, we will have to choose the accept the license okay then will be the administrator uh, password which i mentioned so we'll key in the administrator password we'll choose a very default password standard password and it will configure the sql and all the basic parameters that i mentioned before and it should say something like the sql installation is complete and the server is up okay the sim link is created sim link is nothing but it is a soft link created for the um, service in init.rd initially now we'll check the status of the sql server oops mssql server we need to mention okay so here you see uh, the server is active and running okay uh, so now let's clear the roster and uh, let's download the odbc driver which is a dependency for sql cmd okay so the download download was fast uh, and if you just do uh, ls uh, minus lrh you will see the file size it's just 4 mb so that is why the download was so fast okay so on the similar lines we have to download the sql cmd tools and uh, uh, as you see we have downloaded it and the status is up and running so now let's install the uh, odbc dependency so we'll just uh, mention yum install odbc rpm it will say installation will select the default yes and uh, with the capital yes obviously and its dependency is installed and then we will just install the command line utility mssql tools just keep ms install tools okay we'll give a yes and accept the license okay so the sql cmd is now installed but uh, there's a trick how to we run it so if you just uh, type a which um sql cmd uh, generally it will give you the path of, of any binary uh, not only sql cmd any binary it should give you the path but now i know that the path uh, which should have been there is missing because of the setting up in the environment variable uh, which will be done later on but now if you just want to run it uh, there's a way out or which is the the normal way we can run it so we will move to the path where it is installed opt mssql tools bin here you will see the sql cmd utility so we have to give a dot slash sql cmd minus uh, s uh, for server parameter and we'll give a dot or you can give localhost or the actual host name and you will give the username as sa and password for admin which we have used is admin at one two three and uh, here we will connect so we'll just do a at version 
and we'll see the version that is there so it's uh, SQL Server 2017 and it's based on a Linux uh, uh, 7 core okay so we will uh, try to see um, something from sys databases now if you give a star uh, mind it uh, you might be overwhelmed with the number of columns and the output so if you just want to see uh, some basic things uh, uh, you just choose the columns which are very important to you for to see like we just want to see the names of uh, the databases which we have as of now so we just uh, give select names of this databases and this will give you a very neat output uh, which will be uh, readable but again uh, you can choose uh, the width in the SQL CMD parameter to set this uh, width correctly okay uh, so we will move on to the next uh, video where we will be seeing agent and uh, visual code installation Welcome to SQL Server Administration Basics. In this uh, video, we will be looking into the SQL Server Agent installation and Visual Code installation. So SQL Server Agent, as we know, is the agent uh, or the daemon which is responsible for running jobs primarily. So we will be looking into the installation and configuration. We will be logging into a Windows host uh, and we will be opening a SSMS through which we will be looking into the agent status and everything. Uh, we have a new tool introduced called Visual Code which is uh, a client based tool and a, a .NET code running in the backend to connect to a SQL through which you can create a database, run some scripts or create a job. So we will look into that in detail okay uh, so let's uh, look into the release notes uh, for install sql agent on linux so we will uh, there are a lot of options uh, or flavors of linux on which you can install it so basically for installation on rhl you can do a sudo install of mssql agent uh, after appointing the repo and uh, mostly that's it uh, for installation of an agent but uh, we will do an offline installation so we have downloaded the rpms from the repo which or the files FTP server which we have mentioned before and uh, we'll just uh, do an installation uh, of the agent RPM that we have already got so we will use uh, the RPM file just key in the password for the sudo user and the installation will begin okay so we'll check all the dependency and everything uh, since uh, it is uh, through uh, yum and the installation is a breeze and it is installed so now we'll try to log into a windows server and uh, check the connectivity for an agent so let's log into our windows box and let's try to connect to our uh, sql instance uh, from this box okay we will use a sql authentication as of now we'll key in the password click on remember and click connect Okay, so uh, since we have not uh, mentioned anything in the firewall as an exception, uh, we expect to get uh, this network error. Okay, so this is very basic and uh, this is very normal to get this error. So what you have to do, you need to log into your console back and check the status of the firewall, whether it is running or not. So we'll check that using uh, systemctl. Um, uh, status of uh, firewall D. Okay, um, we'll key in the sudo password and uh, yep, this should give us the status as running. So we now need to add a firewall exception for the server uh, or so the, for the service uh, with a 1433 port and we'll make this as a permanent entry. So we got a success and uh, let's reload the firewall. Okay, so now let's try to connect uh, back to the Windows box. Okay and now if you click connect uh, okay this is how we get it uh, so now we got connected and uh, this is how the agent looks like so uh, this is a, a windows uh, box from where we are logging in and connecting to the ssms so mostly everything will look much familiar here but uh, the core engine is running on uh, our linux in enterprise so that's the difference Okay, uh, so now uh, let's uh, look into the installation of Visual Studio Code. So we have downloaded the RPM from the link we have already mentioned before. So we'll do a yum install of uh, the Visual Code. 
okay uh, so we'll just uh, give the exact path okay and we'll click enter we'll give in the uh, password for the sudo user and the installation will begin and uh, we'll give yes okay and the installation will begin it will complete in no time almost okay will uh, completed okay so let's uh, log in to the server directly since this is a, a, a GUI based uh, component visual code so you have to log into the servers and uh, you may not see the visual code installed directly so that was expected so we will uh, log in to the console again and we'll uh, give a system restart which is init 6 okay so this will uh, reboot the system and it will take some time before it comes up yeah so now we'll try to log into the system okay so here we will use the ad authenticated user sql dot uh, sql frenzy dot local and uh, sql frenzy will be the user uh, we will be covering the ad authentication in our uh, next videos uh, but just wanted to show you how to use ad authenticated user so we'll sign in and it will take some time for the console to come up since the graphic user based components will be loaded for the first time after the reboot okay so we see in uh, programming visual code is installed we'll open it up okay now so before we begin uh, to work on this we need to import a plugin so we'll click on the extensions and uh, we'll search for ms sql and then the first development plugin which we get will install it so we'll install and it will take some time for the installation depending upon your uh, internet bandwidth and the amount of cpu and memory that you have given to this uh, virtual machine okay uh, so once the installation is complete uh, you will have to reload it so you have two options to reload either from here or you can go to a uh, file and uh, create a new file okay and uh, you can click on the left hand side to reload the window okay uh, so once uh, the window is reloaded you have to press f1 and this will launch an interactive menu and you have to click on mssql and click on manage connection properties okay uh, so this will download uh, effectively uh, the connection or the profile uh, that is, or the components that is required to create the profile and then type create and click on this create so it will uh, start creating the profile so first of all it will ask for the server name so you will give the server name and press enter and then it will ask you the database name we will key in master and uh, yeah and press enter and then it will ask for the sql login you have to click on it and give sa and then click again and give the password and click again okay now you need to give a profile we have given dba and then you have to press F1 again and then type SQL okay you have to choose the profile DBA okay and now we will try to create a database for that you just need to type SQL create and you will get an automatic uh, com complete where you can see the template is complete we just have to key in the new database name we will give it new DB and we will change the name below also in the template uh, so the new DB uh, we have to key in again and uh, yes and now to uh, run this query you have to press Control shift e okay uh, that will execute this and you will get a message box or a result box where this will be shown okay uh, so uh, next we will create a job so we'll select everything and then uh, delete it and uh, let's first look into a couple of things before we create a job okay first of all uh, we need to change the context of the session to msdb then we first need to fire the command sp add job so this will effectively as the name suggests create a job the next we will need to call sp add job step here we will document what is the query that will need to execute as part of this job okay the next we need to create a schedule so we will uh, do that by calling sp add schedule and next we'll call sp attach schedule which effectively will attach the schedule we have created to the job we have created 
and then the last we will call sp add job server which will request or which will confirm that the job will be running on the local server okay uh, so let's begin with the first step so first step will be sp add job as uh, mentioned before so as you see, as you see uh, there is an intelligence present so a lot of things will be automatic so uh, first of all we will create a job by mentioning sp add job and we'll give the job name daily system db backup here you need to make sure that the letters are case sensitive and uh, we'll just execute okay so the first step is done the next will be sp add job step here we will make sure that all the things are uh, mentioned in the script here uh, we have intentionally given the database name as uh, master with a spell mistake which will be eventually helping us to debug later next we'll add the job schedule and then we'll attach the schedule as mentioned before okay and in the last step we'll add the job server okay now let's see how do we call this uh, from a uh, sql cmd so we'll uh, check uh, first of all where the binaries are loaded that is in opt uh, ms sql tools and bin okay so we'll uh, log in there and then fire the sql cmd uh, we'll choose the local server username will be sa and the password will be admin at the rate or one two three okay so we're logged in so now let's uh, try to execute the job using sp uh, start job okay okay uh, so let's fire the job and give the job name that is uh, system uh, daily system db backup okay here you need to make sure that the letters are uh, same as you have mentioned we'll fire go oops it will be uh, execute uh, sp underscore start underscore job my bad now let's try to fire it again underscore job okay still going wrong um let's try to give the schema dbo okay still not running i'll tell you so this is why uh, we need to change the context to msdb so now you will see the job successfully started let's exit and uh, now if you log in to the folder or check in the folder where we are expecting the backup to land okay we need to fire this using sudo okay We'll key in the sudo password okay i don't think we have permissions to log into that so we'll try to uh, browse this uh, folder using sudo okay so we'll give sudo minus ls ltr and then we'll give the path as where opt ms sql data okay oops the backup is missing so it was expected since we intentionally gave the name of the database wrong so now let's try to debug this okay uh, so we'll uh, log into the ssms and we'll right click on the database uh, so sorry job and see the history okay so in the history as expected uh, let's go to the output and see a neat message that the database name does not exist because we give it wrong so let's try to correct it we'll uh, open up the job and we'll go to the steps and edit this step Correct the database name there as master. Click OK. Click OK again. Okay. And then go back and retry to run this job. Okay. So login, log in to SQL CMD. And this time we'll set the context to MSDB, which we have learned from our previous mistakes. Okay. And now we'll try to execute the job again. So we'll copy the command from above and we'll paste it and uh, fire this again press go oops so you will get this because we have set a number of retries while setting up the job okay so it's not unknown we'll go back to the server and we'll log into the activity monitor 
so if you go to the activity monitor and check uh, you will see the status as between retries okay so yeah so just go there and stop it or you can wait for another five minutes so the job will stop again but we'll stop it we can't wait for five minutes so we'll go back to terminals and now we'll try to fire it again and this time it did start successfully we quit and if we go back to the directory we will see a neat master dot back there so this is how in short we can debug the jobs in a linux environment uh, welcome to basic sql server administration on linux uh, in this video we will be covering ad joining and authentication to uh, sql through an active directory user this video will be broken into two parts to help one understand the concepts and the commands that are being executed this module will be covering the details required for one to understand the basic concepts related to active directory or uh, rearm joining and then all the nitty gritty related to an ad authentication in the first part uh, we will be covering joining the host to ad domain through command rearm join here we'll be doing some basic steps like setting up the host name we will do it by using a host name ctl set host name then we'll check the resolve.conf to check the dns server details are correct or not further we will edit the krb conf file which is the most critical part of this configuration we can say we have prepared this krb conf file based on our experience and we'll request you to do the same for your setups Next, we will generate the Kerberos authentication files which will help us join the RIAM. Uh, we will then create an AD user which we will set the service principle for the service and the computer name in the Active Directory. Yeah, so first uh, let's start with building a new VM. So we have given the name LSND and uh, LSND911. So this is our new uh, Linux uh, VM that we are setting up and uh, we will set it up for minimal install. We are fast forwarding this install just to uh, save time or the benefit of time. So we have chosen a very basic uh, setup and uh, we are going to configure this with minimal uh, software or minimal server requirement. We will set up the IPs and we will set up the host name and this and uh, just set up the root and user password and let the installation complete okay so finally uh, the server is up and uh, first of all we'll try to uh, log in uh, using root okay and once the login succeeds we will uh, try to open up a terminal which is we are using terminus uh, which is provided in mac and we'll just connect with the same user ID for uh, root and the password for root to connect to this. So we will be configuring everything here since we have done a very minimal install. So it's very, uh, it's not very user friendly to work on the console directly. So we are logging into this terminus, and from here on, uh, we will take up all the checks. Okay. So first of all, we'll check the host name. Now make sure that the host name is a full FUDN. Okay. Then we'll check etc resolve.conf to make sure that the name server or the DNS shows up correctly. Okay. Then we'll do the installation for triple SD, RIAMD, uh, KRB workstation, KRB5 workstation, and uh, ADCLI. Now these are the, the four softwares that will be required mandatorily for Active Directory joining. Okay. So we'll zoom through this installation as it will take some time uh, because it will download some packages uh, over the internet. Okay, so you can set up your local repo also and uh, you know uh, save the internet bandwidth every time you do this. So you can set up a repo server for your own uh, lab. Okay, okay. Uh, so once uh, we are done with this installation, we'll be moving to a very important part next. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we'll try to check whether we are able to ping our local domain that is a uh, SQL frenzy dot local. So if we get a response from our Active Directory server or the DNS server that uh, the response is coming. So this is very important part and if this is not working, the next part is uh, definitely not going to work. The next we will be looking into the 
KRB5 configuration, which is the Kerberos configuration main file. So it's placed in ATC. So now, first of all, we'll create a backup of that file before we edit the actual file. Okay. So first of all, let's see the content. Okay. So this is a very uh, example or, or a demo uh, type of uh, file. Now we have prepared this file uh, using based on our experience as mentioned before. So make sure that you use this file and this file is present in the documentation part of this uh, video series. Okay. So once you update that, uh, let's go back to the AD server and uh, let's create a user. Uh, uh, Active Directory user SQL on Linux. So this is the user which we will be using to authenticate the server over this uh, domain controller, okay, or Active Directory. So we'll be uh, creating this user and uh, we'll create a password and make sure that the password never expires. Just give it a standard password, okay, and then click on next. Okay, so once finished, uh, let's uh, check this user once and uh, this is just a member of domain users. We have not given it any special privilege. Okay, so now let's go back uh, to our uh, uh, Linux uh, terminus. Okay, and uh, let's just uh, do a K in it. Now this is a Kerberos initialization command. This will create the Kerberos ticket. This is a very important step. Without this ticket, you will not be able to do anything for Kerberos. Okay. The next we do is K list, which will just uh, list out the Kerberos ticket. Now, first of all, let's try to uh, install SQL because we will be configuring the in the end our ultimate aim is to connect to a sql server using a domain authenticated user to set up kerberos authentication for a particular service that is sql server first of all we will have to install sql so next what we do is uh, we copy the binaries required for sql server to the uh, vm uh, that we have just created i have a local uh, uh, binaries copied in my in my uh, Laptop, so I'm just uh, SCPing uh, these files to my uh, newly created Linux node uh, in the temporary file. So now, if you do, you do a directory listing, you will see all the binaries are present. So just uh, do a yum install, and we will be fast forwarding this install because we have covered this in detail in the other video tutorial for SQL Server installation. Okay. So once this installation is complete. Uh, you will have to uh, run the uh, configuration command which will uh, actually run the configuration part of uh, the setup like the licensing and the uh, SA password uh, and the licensing uh, that we have to accept. So after all this is done, the SQL server will be up and running. Okay, so you will see a uh, text that uh, this is an evaluation version uh, which is because we have uh, 180 days licensing or uh, expiry part that is now tagged with SQL Server whenever you download RDM. Okay, so next uh, let's check the status of the SQL Server using System CTL MS SQL Server. So uh, it will be shown as running. And next uh, we will install the MS SQL tools or SQL CMD. For that, there are a couple of dependencies like ODBC and all. So we will be installing that also. And we are fast forwarding this install as well because we have covered as mentioned before we have covered this in another tutorial in in very detail okay so once uh, this uh, sql cmd is installed so we will try to just uh, connect to sql and check whether our basic connectivity is correct or not so that's in opd ms sql tool bin so uh, you just have to uh, connect using SQL CMD and uh, we'll give a local server username will be SA and the password will be the standard password that we have used for all the uh, logins that we have created in this tutorial. So you see uh, we are able to connect. We'll just check the version quickly. Okay. So once this is done, we'll quit and uh, we'll just check if the ticket is still there. So we just do a K list. Okay. Now post this, uh, let's try to join the realm. Now, just remember we have created a domain user and not granted it any specific domain specific uh, access. 
okay so we are trying to authenticate a server using a very basic active directory user okay so uh, once we key in all the details uh, you will see we will uh, need to key in the password for that and then you will see a failure okay now this is expected so whenever you are trying to authenticate a, a, a particular service for a user over a domain make sure that the user you are using to authenticate does have a domain user or domain admin rights okay so we'll go back and we'll click on member of tab and then add it to a domain admin so we'll just type domain click on check names and add this to a domain admin okay so this is a very important step and I uh, just wanted to show you guys that this failure will happen now let's try to join the realm once again or let's try to join the domain once again this time you will see the installation will complete without any error now this is a very important step that you need to remember that we have done now let's go back to the active directory and check for the new computers that have been added you will see that the name appears here now we'll click on this trust for delegation this will be required for our Kerberos authentication okay so we need to make sure that this is checked on if uh, we need to set up the Kerberos authentication okay and the next step uh, we'll uh, go back to the PowerShell and uh, try to set the SPN for the SQL Server service now the command is very straightforward MSSQL SVC slash the node name with FQDN colon uh, the port number followed by the domain name user and that is SQL frenzy slash uh, SQL on Linux okay so this is a straightforward command for registering uh, the Kerberos for a particular service on a server next uh, let's uh, check whether we have set the SPN correctly or not so we will type the command set SPN minus L so we should see these four specific outputs and make sure that you see all these four outputs without this uh, there is something not correct in the configurations okay okay so now uh, before moving to the next section uh, let us look into a couple of things uh, that we will require to understand in setting up the SQL service key tab so first of all we have KVNO now KVNO stands for key version number now this number is important in setting up all the parameters that we will be using the next utility KTUtil now KTUtil is Kerberos ticket utility okay so here uh, we will be using add ent which stands for add entry and we will be adding two entries of encryption in this so first encryption we will be adding is AES 256 CTS HMAC SHA 196 and the next one we will be adding is RC4 HMAC now these are the two types of encryption through which the tickets will be communicating with each, with each other the next we are using is WKT which is writing the current key list entries into the key tab file so uh, post this we will be uh, updating the MSSQL conf for network Kerberos key tab file with the key tab file that we have just generated using the ktutil command okay so post this our SQL server service will be able to communicate using Kerberos authentication okay so now let's look into the demo now let's go back to our uh, Linux terminus and just uh, see the KVNO number now this will give a figure of two or three depending upon a lot of factors but all we need to take back is the numeric digit that is shown in the output next we'll fire a uh, KT util which is the Kerberos ticket utility and we will add some entries for encryption using uh, the keyword addent okay so uh, we will add two encryptions one is AES 256 and the other will be RC4 Mac HMAC okay so these are the two entries uh, we have added for encryption and uh, next we will be asked for a password the last step we will do is write these key tab entries into a key tab file for the SQL server next we'll make sure that the ownership of these uh, this key tab file is changed to sql server and the user rights are changed to 400 okay next uh, we will update the kerberos key tab file in the 
MS SQL Quanf using set network Kerberos Kata file. Post this, it will ask us for the SQL server to restart. Okay, so after restarting, the service will connect using SQL CMT and uh, system administrator login and password. Okay, once we are inside, we will create a login for the domain user that we have just authenticated. That is SQL Frenzy slash SQL on Linux. Okay from Windows okay so this is a general syntax for creating a login for SQL server next we will alter the permission of this server role sysadmin and add member uh, SQL frenzy SQL on Linux okay so this step will be required for granting system administrator privileges to this domain user SQL on Linux uh, next, uh, we'll uh, see if this user is actually created in the server principles. So we'll just query uh, name from sys.serverprinciples. Okay, and in the last name, you will see SQL Frenzy SQL on Linux shows up. So we'll quit and next, this time, we'll connect to the server using uh, FQDN. So we'll give minus S LSNDE 911.sqlfrenzy.local. And then we'll give minus E for interested login. And now we'll see we are able to log in using a Kerberos ticket. So we'll just select system underscore user, which is which will show us the present user that is SQL frenzy slash SQL on Linux. Welcome to SQL Server Administration Basics. In this uh, video, we'll be covering SQL Server Basic Administration on Linux. In this uh, video, we will be looking into two parts. First, we will be changing the default da data directory for any new user database that is created. And the next part, we will be looking into changing the default backup directory for any new backup that is being taken. Okay, uh, so first, uh, we will need to uh, log in into the SQL Server using SQL CMD, which is in OPT MS SQL Tools Bins. So uh, you'll have to give the default parameters uh, that is uh, minus s dot for local server, then user and password for SA, and then you'll be able to log into the SQL CMD. We will be using uh, sys dot master underscore files to check the default uh, values of the files. And as you can see, the data and the log file belong to the var opt MS SQL data. Okay, we'll quit here and uh, we'll create uh, the required directories uh, so we'll use mkdir command he'll be using minus p parameter which will create the directories recursively so we don't have to create it two times so we'll uh, fire the command mkdir minus p slash mssql slash data okay and uh, post this will also change the ownership minus r we will use for recursively assigning the ownership to MS SQL uh, user and MS SQL group okay so uh, after this uh, if you just uh, see the ownership uh, by using ls lrh uh, slash MS SQL or slash you will see uh, the folder permissions for MS SQL and for data it will be the MS SQL user which is uh, the prerequisite okay Okay, uh, so now we will use the uh, MSSQL conf file to set the parameters of the default directory. So it's uh, the parameter we have to use is file location dot default directory and then give the default directory which we have created that's MSSQL slash data. Post this, it will ask you to restart the service. You will use system CTL restart MSSQL service command to restart the service. And then we'll try to connect uh, to the SQL server using uh, SQL CMD once again. And uh, we'll try to see the default directories first, what are present. For that, we will again use the sys.master files. And uh, if you just fire go, you will see that uh, as of now, uh, all the things remain the same. So old uh, directories have not changed. However, if you create a new database, say new DB, and then fire the command again you will see that uh, the new folders or the new files have been created in under mssql data now there is another parameter which you can set to change the log default directory as well okay so that will be file locations and uh, default uh, log directory 
now to see where uh, these configurations are being updated you can go to where opt mssql mssql conf here you will see the default uh, data directory has been updated so this is what overrides all the default properties that are being set in sql server for sql server on linux okay so next uh, we will see how to update uh, the default backup directory that is being uh, used or being configured for sql server so for that first of all uh, let's try to take a backup of a database that we have just created okay so let's uh, connect to sql cmd and uh, let's try to take a backup of any database and uh, we'll see where the database uh, backup file goes to okay so we'll just fire the command uh, select a name from sys databases just to see uh, what are the databases that we have so we have a lot of databases we have two new two new databases created so we'll just take a backup of the databases new db to disk and we will give uh, uh, we'll give the name uh, new db uh, dot back and uh, we'll uh, fire the command okay so you'll see the backup has been processed okay so we will uh, try to see where the default backup directory or where the default backup has gone so for that we will fire the command ls uh, minus lrh and uh, we will give the path that is where opt mssql data okay so here you will see the new db dot uh, backup which is by default created so now we'll uh, fire the command to update uh, the location but before that uh, let's create the backup directory under the mssql slash mssql slash uh, slash mssql folder um, and uh, after that uh, let's try, uh, try to change the ownership of it because as you see now it is under the ownership of root so we'll have to change the ownership so we'll fire the command chown mssql colon mssql and then the directory path that is slash mssql slash backup okay so post this if you see the listing again so you will see uh, both the backup and the data directory are now running under mssql so now let's fire the command which will the update the default backup location so we will need to fire the command mssql conf set file location default backup directory slash mssql slash backup post this it will ask us to restart the sql server service again so we'll use system ctl restart mssql server okay so once this comes up uh, let's try to check the uh, sql cmd and let's try to log into sql cmd and let's fire a backup again so backup database new db uh, to disk and uh, we will give again a new name that is uh, uh, new db underscore one dot back okay underscore one dot back okay and uh, we'll fire the command okay and we'll see the uh, backup has been processed so we'll quit and again go to the folder that we have created we'll see the listing from there uh, llmssql slash backup and now you see the new db underscore one dot back has been created in the new folder mssql backup so this is how you can change the default backup directory okay uh, so post this uh, we can also see the mssql conf which is under var opt mssql so here you will see a new entry for the default backup directory that we have created under mssql backup Welcome to SQL Server Administration Basics and this uh, part 2 of this module we will be covering changing default port for SQL Server, changing the default dump type for SQL Server, changing the max server memory, setting up trace flags and finally changing the default collation for a new user database. Okay, uh, to check the default port, uh, first uh, let's uh, check into the log directory where the default log for SQL Server is kept and now let's try to grab the error log for the keyword IPv4 okay so you see it shows the uh, port number 1433 so now let's try to uh, update the default port to something uh, different than 1433 we will use mssql conf set network dot tcp port and we will set it to 4444 okay after this it will ask us to restart the SQL server so we will just uh, key in systemctl restart mssql server okay 
okay so let's uh, wait for the system to come up okay now we'll see the output of the error log again and if you grab you will see that the ipv4 is now pointing to 4444 okay so the server is basically listening to uh, 4444 port now okay uh, so now let's uh, connect to sql server using sql cmd so uh, basically uh, the parameters will change slightly so you will give s uh, dot followed by a comma and then the port number that is 4444 and then you have to key in the username as sa and uh, the password for server administrator okay uh, so you will see you are able to connect uh, we'll just quit here and uh, the next thing we will do is try to set up the default dump type now in this uh, core dump type uh, there are two parts one is uh, capture mini and full and is the other one is the core dump type now if the capture mini and full is set to true there will be two dumps created uh, which will be the first one will be defined by the core dump type and the second uh, mini dump will be auto generated so we will set uh, the core dump type uh, mini and full to be true and after this uh, the sql server will ask for a restart and then we will set the code dump type to also full so this will uh, generate all the logs that are required including the maps for the process ids which will be further required to debug what uh, related to what uh, the actual dump had occurred and we can see these settings are being updated in again the var opt ms sql ms sql conf file so you will see the core dump uh, type and the core mini and full to be set to true okay uh, so next uh, let's try to set the max memory uh, setting in uh, sql server linux so first of all uh, let's uh, log into the sql server uh, in uh, using sql cmd okay we'll give the default uh, server name and then the port number give the username as sa and then the password for system admin okay now so now we are logged in let's fire sv configure okay so by default everything will not be on or you will not be able to see anything so you have to set the show advanced options to one which is uh, by default zero okay so you just have to key in show advanced option and then press you have to also additionally give one as an option to set it to one and then fire the reconfigure again okay so once you fire reconfigure and then again uh, run sp configure okay we'll run sp configure again uh, with uh, max server uh, as the keyword so if you give a distinct keyword it will give you the correct uh, output so it has given us the only option that is max server memory so here you see the memory is set to 2 tb so now uh, if you want to set it or trim it down we will use msql conf set memory memory limit and we will key in 3328 which is an MB and post this it will ask us to restart the MSSQL server okay so we restart the SQL server using system CTL okay and uh, after this uh, you will be able to see the updated value of the M memory in the MSSQL conf file so to see that we will again go to uh, var opt MSSQL MSSQL conf file and uh, here you see the memory limit is set to 3328 okay okay uh, so now let's try to set the a couple of trace flags to do that uh, first of all we'll log into uh, sql server and make sure there are what are the trace flags that are already enabled so we'll uh, use sql cmd uh, key in the server name key in the port number mention the username and then the password for the user okay uh, so once we are logged in uh, let's fire dbcc trace status and key in minus one uh, that will be global so it will show us globally what are the trace enabled so nothing is enabled as of now so we'll just quit and we'll run the mssql conf uh, setup and uh, we will use a trace flag and we will key in two trace flags one triple two and one two zero four on and uh, we'll restart the sql server and uh, post this we'll try to connect to sql cmd again and then fire the dbcc trace status minus one again uh, which will show us globally what are the trace flags enabled and this time you will see uh, the two trace flags are shown so one two zero four and one two triple two okay so now uh, let's see the output of the msql conf as well uh, so here also you will see that the trace flags are enabled one triple two and one two zero four 
so this is how we can enable the trace flags and now in the in, in the next part uh, we'll try to unset uh, one of the settings of the uh, network port that we have done so here we will just call unset tcp network port and if you see the conf output now the port number in the sql server which was mentioned has gone so now let's try to uh, restart the service and then connect back uh, using sql cmd so now if you see uh, we just have to restart this using system ctl restart msql server and uh, post is done let's try to connect to the sql using sql cmd so we'll key in uh, we'll go to the where opt mssql tools bin sql cmd and we'll key in s dot and we'll give username and then the password for system admin and you will see that we are able to log in without giving the port number so this is how you can unset one of the parameters that was already set in uh, the mssql conf file also let's uh, try to look into the error log so that we did before so we'll go to where opt mssql logs and uh, we'll uh, grab uh, we'll grab the ipv4 keyword okay and here you will see it has changed back to 1433 okay uh, so next uh, let's try to see what is the status of the sql server so we'll just uh, type in uh, system ctl status mssql server okay uh, let's try to see where we are hopefully we are in uh, opt mssql tool spin so we'll just fire sql cmd and uh, we'll uh, log in as the user sa and we'll give the password okay uh, so the intent here is to see what is the default collation or what is the present collation of sql server yeah to do that uh, we will choose uh, the server property of uh, the sql server and uh, we will see uh, the present collation is uh, sql latin general cp1 ci and as okay so we will also identify the same for all the databases that are present in uh, sys.databases so we'll just uh, ch select name and collation name from uh, sys.databases okay so if you see uh, all are having the same collation so now let's quit and let's try to uh, update the collation so we will uh, stop the mssql server first which is a prerequisite uh, to change the collation now let's uh, fire the keyword uh, that is uh, mssql conf MSSQL, MSSQL bin, MSSQL conf set collision. Okay, and this is an interactive menu, so it will give us the option to key in the collision. So we will give the collision as uh, case sensitive and then access and access sensitive. Okay, so this will configure the SQL server and uh, rebuild all the things that are required to change the, uh, you know, the collision of the server. And after that, it will ask us to restart the service. So we'll start the MSSQL server. Okay, and then we'll see the status of the SQL server service. We will do that using system CTL status MSSQL server. So once we see that it is running, okay, uh, then we will uh, run to SQL CMD and then fire the same command again. Select collision and uh, collision underscore uh, will select select name and then collision underscore name from sys.databases databases. Okay, so this will give us the new collision for which we have created for all the databases, which is case sensitive and access sensitive okay so here again we'll go and create a new database uh, with a new collation okay so now we'll try to uh, uh, quit and we'll try to revert back to the original collation uh, so for that uh, we will have to stop the mssql server again okay so once it is stopped uh, we'll fire the set collation command again and here we will give the collision as uh, case insensitive okay which was uh, the original one now if you fire uh, 
enter you will see uh, the output is not as verbose as the previous one and uh, if you start uh, try to start a SQL server and uh, log in again you will see that uh, the collision is uh, still not changed okay so there is a little bit of gotcha here uh, which uh, we will tell you in a minute but uh, let's first uh, see whether it actually has not changed so if you see the name and collation name from sister databases um, the yeah so you will see that uh, the collision has not changed uh, so first of all the collision um, has will change only when you disconnect or detach all the user databases so we will drop the database test here and we will uh, stop the SQL server service again and we'll try to run the collision I will try to run the set collision command again and this time uh, we'll uh, key in uh, case insensitive again which was the default one okay and now you will see uh, the similar kind of verbose output which we saw in the first attempt okay here it will update all the index pages and uh, everything so uh, this is the one of the key things to remember that uh, while you are changing the collation there should be no user databases attached to the SQL server either you can take a backup drop it and then restore uh, and that will restore with the original collation which the database was created or uh, you can uh, detach uh, and then attach the files again okay so now if you check the collision name all the system databases have gone back to the ci which is case insensitive which was the original collision okay and now if you try to create a new database test uh, and then fire the keywords uh, yeah you will see that the new database is created again with the same collision 